So if you recall, the uh, electron transport chain is made of three globs, or we call complexes more. Better to say the word complex than globs. We have, um, and this is the one that I want you to, the slide that I want you to study from for the way the um, electrons are flowing. Remember that each um, species in each complex is a um, electron holder. And you can see that whatever it's in the reduced form, it has the electrons. And whenever it's in the oxidized form, it's given it up. So here, NADH has the electrons. It's passing it on to an enzyme-bound coenzyme called FMN. Then it passes the line. The NAD no longer has it. And then the FMN has it. So it's a bucket brigade. It's really the best way to think of it. So we're passing electrons from FADH2 and NADH all the way to coenzyme Q. Coenzyme Q travels within the membrane to complex 3, gives it to more iron sulfur centers, another cytochrome, or a cytochrome um, C, which has um, iron cofactor, to a different cytochrome C, which actually goes out um, of the membrane back into it and into complex 4, um, which goes to um, a cytochrome A, A3, and a copper ion. Um, I'm not really going to ask what is the specific order. Does it go to the iron sulfur center or the FMN first? I'm not going to ask about that. I just want you to know what's in each complex. So you don't have to know iron sulfur, then cytochrome C1. You know, I, I just know that those are in complex three. How do you read that again? So I get the first two. So here, to read this, when it has either the hydrogen or in the reduced form, it has the electrons. So here, this has the hydrogen. It's reduced. It's passing it on to FMN. Now, this is, so this is a reaction. You can think of the arrow going down. NAD no longer has it. FMN has it. FMN H2 has the electrons. It's going to react with FS, an iron sulfur center. That's in the oxidized form. It's going to give it back up. Now the iron sulfur center has the electrons. The FMN no longer does. It's ready to accept more. Just like when you're in a bucket brigade, you, you have the water, you pass it off. And then you're, you're going back. When you go back, you no longer have the water. Right? So the electron could go from the iron sulfur to the? So now it, in the reduced form, it has the electrons. Right. It's passing it along to coenzyme Q. Now see, now it doesn't have it, and now this does. So when they're, they're touching here, that's where the passing of the electrons happens. You're pouring the electrons from, from this guy into this guy. And, and so on, down the, down the tube. This is what they really look like. It would be kind of funny if they were colored like this. But they're, again, they're globs along our inner membrane. And you can see um, these phospholipids, these little balls with the little lines here, those are the phospholipids that make up our membranes. We're going to study that later on this semester. But here's complex 1, complex 2, complex 3, and complex 4. Notice that um, complex 1, 3, and 4 span the membrane, but complex 2 does not. Now, we said in the previous slide that complex 1 and 2 supply electrons to coenzyme Q. UQ is another way to write coenzyme Q. So coenzyme Q is also known as ubiquinone. UQ and coenzyme Q are the same thing. So notice that I said um, before that complex 1 and complex 2 give their electrons to coenzyme Q or ubiquinone, and it travels through inside the membrane. And then to complex 3, complex 3 gives the electrons to a cytochrome C. This cytochrome C can go into the inner membrane space and travels back to complex 4, which then gives its electrons to oxygen. We're going to get back to the differences between them. But um, what do you think? All right, so this, these are the, the membranes made of phospholipids. The little ball is a phosphate, and the um, waggly tails are 
our hydrocarbon chain. What do you think ubiquinone or coenzyme Q looks like, or its nature is, if it can go through this part? It has hydrophobic, or it has a part that makes it mostly hydrophobic. So we, you guys are learning. See, if you knew that, then you, you've got a huge concept from this semester that I'm very proud of. All right, but cytochrome C can go in and out, so it has both hydrophobic and on, um, hydrophilic parts, so it can go back out. All right, so what we're gonna do now is um, take a look at each complex and I want to mention that the, the order that I have on the slides, the cartoons that I have on the slides, aren't necessarily going to reflect exactly what I have on slide 15. So the order might be different, there might be some extra things, because I'm trying to teach this in a sort of basic level in this class, although the, the only things I could find were a little bit more complex. So study from slide 15 and know that um, these other ones might be a little bit more complex. So here in complex one, there's, um, there's some new information I wanna, I wanna tell you. Okay, so we know that we're gonna take the reduced coenzymes from the citric acid cycle in glycolysis. We're gonna take that reduced coenzyme, we're gonna pass the electrons to our enzyme-bound FMN. We're gonna take a look at FMN in the next slide. But then it's going to pass it on to um, these <laughs> orange and pink things, or yellow and pink things, called iron sulfur centers. We're gonna take a look at those, too. So we're passing the electrons and passing, passing. So there's a bunch of iron sulfur centers. Um, so there's six to eight of them in here. So I want you to know NADH, FMN, iron sulfur centers, then to coenzyme Q. In that, though, in the passing of the electrons from the NADH to FMN to the different iron sulfur centers, there's, you are going to take four hydrogen ions and pass it from the matrix into the intermembrane space. That's very important. <coughs> Guy? Guy? You okay? Yeah. Okay. So um, you're gonna take four, four protons from the matrix and pass them into the intermembrane space. It's very, very important that we know that, that there's um, the amount of free energy that is, re that is released by passing those electrons along gives enough off so that we can pump protons from the matrix into the intermembrane space. So if you want in your notes, write matrix, intermembrane space, that might be a good thing to do. All right, so we have our coenzyme Q. It's picked up the hydrogens, the hydrides. So you can see those hydrogens are, are holding those, those electrons. All right, let's take a look at um, one of the new electron carriers. This is FMN, and it, it picks up the two hydrogens here and here. Um, I'm not gonna ask you the structure. I'm just showing you. Just know that FMN is in that one. But I just wanted to show you. It picks up the um, two hydrogens there. Um, oh, does anybody need? So I'm not going to ask you to draw the structure or even to recognize it. Just know that FMN is another coenzyme, a new coenzyme that can pick up and carry um, hydrides, electrons. And it's going to pick them up here and here, right here and right here. That's where they're picking them up. But I'm not going to ask you that. I just want you to know that it's a coenzyme that is um, carrying um, electrons. Iron sulfur centers, so cool. All right, so these are um, non-heme iron proteins. So because so many, when we, when we encounter iron in our enzymes and our proteins, so often when there's iron in those proteins, it's in a heme structure. We'll, we'll look at that again later, like as in hemoglobin, it's in that heme structure. So we need to point out when iron is present that it's not in the heme structure. So we, that's why we call it a non-heme iron structure. So um, they're different. You can have a, um, 
oops, I'm sorry, a, a two iron or a four iron. There's two different forms. And they're held together or held to the, the proteins um, through uh, sulfur bonds, sulfur coordinate covalent bonds. But what really is doing the work is the iron. <coughs> so when it picks up electrons, it's going from iron three to iron two. When it's giving it off, it's going from, from uh, iron two to iron three. All right, so do, you, do I need to write that, say that again? When the ions of the iron sulfur centers are picking up electrons, it goes from the oxidation of plus three to plus two. When it's giving them off, it's going from um, plus two to plus three. So it's being oxidized. So reducing, picking up the electrons, going from three to two, oxidation two to three. You definitely need to know, I'm, I'm for sure 100% going to be asking that um, question. So the, the work that's being done in the iron sulfur centers is the iron. What makes it have a different, slightly different standard reduction potential is going to be the environment in that non-heme iron protein and that iron sulfur center, the amino acids that are surrounding it will make those irons have a different standard reduction potential, different affinity for electrons. Sure. So what's doing the work of the iron sulfur centers is the iron. All right. There, it's being oxidized and reduced back and forth. But all the, whenever you see iron, it's doing that. What's making this iron different from other iron is the chemical environment. And that chemical environment is the sulfurs around it and the amino acids around it. That would be a good question. Why would, the, why would the irons that you see in the electron transport chain have different standard reduction potentials? That would be a great question, wouldn't it? That would be, yeah, I like that. I like that question. Okay. The sulfurs around it, the amino acids, the chemical environment, really. If you say chemical environment, I'd give you the credit. I'd yeah. love you to say the sulfurs and the amino acids. But really, what makes the irons have a different standard reduction potential is the chemical environment. Looks kind of freaky. Look at that. It's kind of weird. All right. Um, we didn't talk about coenzyme Q very much. Um, how many people uh, go to GNC and buy CoQ10 so that they can get more energy out of their workouts? Huh? Yeah, be careful. He has to take CoQ10. Does anybody know why it's 10, not 8 or 6? What does a 10 refer to? Does anybody know? Anybody that's taken any other biology classes, you might have heard this. You didn't hear about this in any other biology class? You did, but you don't remember? <laughs> okay. The 10 is um, this isoprenoid unit. Do you see how it has the brackets around it and then this N? That means that it repeats. And for mammals, it repeats 10 times. Bacteria repeats 6. So be sure that you don't go to GNC and buy CoQ6. It won't work for you. I'm trying to be funny. It's really not working <laughs> on a Monday morning. Okay, so this is CoQ10 because the isoprenoid unit repeats 10 times. Do you mean to say that again? It's CoQ10 because the isoprenoid unit repeats 10 times. So if this repeats 10 times, that's wicked long, right? So remember the CoQ10 is swimming in that, um, along the membrane, in that hydrophobic part. So this part is what's making it hydrophobic. <coughs> and so here, this ring, the quinone form, um, 
It's not so hydrophobic. It's got four oxygens on it, right? So it's not really hydrophobic, but that isoprenoid unit makes it, <coughs> excuse me, hydrophobic. So here what it's doing is it's resonance stabilized to accept one electron on, it, on its, uh, at a time, um, but then it can ultimately accept two electrons as hydrides and makes our coenzyme QH2 or ubiquinol or reduced form or hydroquinone form. In this class, let's keep it sim simple. I'm going to call it CoQ, reduced form of CoQ, all right? But you might, I, I have uh, license to use U. Q. You might read it in other textbooks as UQ. I'll try to stick to CoQ on the exam. But I, I, I think it is important to, to see that it is um, called different things. All right, you guys ready? We, we know everything about complex one now. NADH, we've seen that structure before. FMN, we've now seen that structure. Carries electrons. Iron sulfur centers, have the iron that do, that's doing the work, and now it's passed along to coenzyme Q. Complex two, some classes don't even cover this, right? Because it does not have enough free energy in passing the electrons from the FADH2 to uh, iron sulfur centers and then to coenzyme Q. Um, don't worry about this heme one, all right? Just know FADH2, iron sulfur centers, coenzyme Q. Um, it does not have enough to drive ATP production. That means there's no protons being pumped from the matrix to the inner membrane space. So some classes don't even cover it. Now, um, in this one, we're showing that it does span the membrane, I tend to believe that other picture, that it's, it's not spanning the membrane. There's another source of FADH2, and that is going to be through um, fatty acid oxidation that we're going to um, see later on. So um, the first complex had enough free energy. This one is the only one, the only complex that doesn't provide enough free energy to pump, pump protons. This is the only one that you cannot pump protons. Complex three. There, this one is not a great picture because it's um, too busy. Complex three, there's more to complex three than what we're going to talk about. Um, the electrons are going to be taken up by our, um, let's just look at this part right here. All right. This is the Q cycle. We're not going to look at this part. So you can X out this part of this picture, but you want to take a look at this part. So you're going to take the electrons from the reduced form of coenzyme Q, you're going to give it to iron sulfur centers and cytochrome C1. Then that's going to pass it along to cytochrome C. Sure, it's, you're going to take it from uh, the coenzyme Q, this QH2. That's the same thing as coenzyme Q. Yeah, QH2 is the same thing as coenzyme Q. And then it's going to pass it to iron sulfur centers and cytochrome C1. Then it's going to pass it, that cytochrome C1 is going to pass it along to cytochrome C. We're going to talk about the cytochromes in one second. But this does provide enough free energy to, um, to, drive, uh, the, uh, to drive the pumping of protons into the inner membrane space. So four protons are pumped. Does it provide enough free energy to pump? Okay, so let's talk about um, this Q cycle. I'm not going to talk about it. I do mention it here, but I, I'm not going to test you on it or talk about it at all on the exam. 
<coughs> the cytochromes are a group of, um, of proteins. They do contain the heme prosthetic group, but they're not meant to carry oxygen. All right. It's the same prosthetic group, but what, it, what the iron in the prosthetic is doing is being oxidized and reduced instead of carrying oxygen. That's kind of cool. It's doing double, double duty, that, that heme prosthetic group. So here's the heme prosthetic group. Remember the iron um, is, being in, is in a coordinate covalent um, bond. Do you guys remember what I, meant, I said about the coordinate covalent bond? Where you're looking at metal ions that have empty d orbitals, and both electrons come from lone pairs from, say, nitrogens. So see these nitrogens right here? Those are resting in empty d orbitals of our iron. So it's, it's holding it in. So here, um, you can see that, that you have this ring structure holding this iron in. So this is basically a heme group. Now, you have these numbered positions. And you can see in these different positions, we have different groups. I'm not going to ask you the difference. All right, I'm not going to test you on that. But just know that the way we get the cytochrome C1 and the cytochrome A to have different standard reduction potentials is to change what groups are on these positions. Bless you. So we're passing along from cytochrome C1 to cytochrome C to cytochrome a3 to A, you know, there's a lot of passing along. They all contain this heme group. But what's different is that um, between the A cytochromes and the C cytochromes is that they have these different groups on there in these different positions. So that chemical environment is making it um, a little, uh, uh, this iron have a little standard, different standard reduction potential. So look at it, it's, it's like, okay, here's the first layer around it, the nitrogen. And then the second layer around it, it's still the same. It's this third layer around the iron that becomes different and only slightly different. So that third layer around the iron is enough of a difference to cause the standard reduction potential of the iron to be different in these different um, cytochrome. That's a profound effect. If you guys haven't studied um, NMR, you, um, you might not have the appreciation for that. But those of you that have studied NMR, you know the effect on, say, hydrogens or carbons of chemical environment that's even kind of far away from those carbons and hydrogens um, that um, it may be new to you. So I think it's kind of cool that it this, this real application of, of the chemical environment. All right, so that's um, the cytochromes. Complex four, again, this slide is busier than I want it to be, but it's going to take this cytochrome C that we just um, reduced, and it's going to be oxidized. It's going to give it to different cytochrome A's and to copper ions. That's all I need you to know. There's cytochrome A's, and then we just talked about the difference between cytochrome C's and cytochrome A's, but cytochrome um, and, and copper ions. Remember, copper ions have the oxidation states of one and two instead of two and three. So one and two for copper instead of two and three for, um, for iron. So again, cytochrome C is going to give it to um, copper ions and cytochrome A's, two different cytochrome A's. And then what is the ultimate electron acceptor? Oxygen. oxygen. So we're going to give it along to oxygen to make water. So complex four is the link to oxygen. If you don't have oxygen around, can't complete this. We do have enough um, energy to pump two protons from the matrix to the inner membrane space. So four, four, and two. And complex two is not doing really anything. The 
In fact, complex two is so um, boring that some slides I said don't, don't even um, show it. So here we have our NADH, FMN, ion sulfur centers, to coenzyme Q. Know that complex two supplies more coenzyme Q reduced form. So that's really what you want to know about coenzyme Q. I mean, uh, the complex two. And so here then we're going to take the coenzyme Q and don't worry about the Q cycle. Go to iron sulfur centers, cytochrome C1, cytochrome C, and come down to give uh, cytochrome A. And they, this one doesn't have the copper in it, so maybe you might want to um, put your, your uh, copper ions in there. And I believe this still works. I checked it out the other day and it, it was working. I'm wondering if there's something wrong with the connection here. Yes, Aaron. Bottom half of the yeah, for us. It's not irrelevant, but it is for us. We're, we're just not going to talk about it. So that last slide is a good summary slide for the different complex that you It, it is, but it leaves out complex too. <sighs> There's something wrong here. Because I checked this. Anyway, I'll try to come up with something Friday to summarize this. Okay. Here's the free energy. Um, you can see, I'm, I'm not going to focus on this. I'm going to focus on, on this one. This is complex one. This is complex two. I mean, uh, three. And this is complex four. So you can see that we get a lot of free energy in these three complexes. Complex two is not really on here, yeah, because it doesn't take the FADH. So it's not, complex two is not um, addressed here because we're not taking it from that FADH. But you can see that the free energy from these three complexes is significant. And that free energy is going to be used to pump those, those protons uphill. And so we're going to see next what we can do with those protons. But before we do, and before we take a break, what I want to talk about is how did we figure out that it goes from NADH to FMN to the iron sulfur centers to coenzyme Q? How do we figure that out? Well, the way we did that is we used um, respiratory inhibitors. So what uh, probably graduate students did is they isolated mitochondria, which isn't too hard. They provided something that, the, um, that allowed electron transport to occur, and they added a molecule. And then they saw what built up. What, what species, what molecules built up? And if they built up, they knew, they knew that they were gonna, they were going to be connected. So let's take a look at that. They, they found three sites in which inhibitors had an effect. So this, is, this should be familiar to you, We're, that first slide 15. This is what we took a look at, right? So you have the thing that has the electrons giving it to the thing that doesn't, ha that doesn't have the electrons. Now it has the electrons. Reacting with the next thing that doesn't have the electrons. Passes along. Now that has the electrons. So note that here, this reduced carrier that has the electrons is going to react with this oxidized carrier, so that this carrier 3 now has it. You guys with me? So now, if I put something in that inhibits this reaction, then we're going to accumulate, get higher levels of both this one and this one. So if we stop this one reaction, this and this is going to get built up. Well, if they both get built up out of all the things in your in your complex, then they must be associated together. I see a lot of blank faces. Does that make any sense to you guys? All right, I see the people in the front row saying yes, and some people in the third row saying yes. No, remember, this is reacting with this. So reduced carrier two is reacting with oxidized carrier three to produce oxidized carrier two and reduced carrier three. That's a reaction. 
reduced carrier 2 plus oxidized carrier 3 produces oxidized carrier 2 and reduced carrier 3. So it's carrier 3, carrier 3, carrier 2. If I stop this reaction from happening, then the reaction can't go forward. And what happens is the reactions happen up until this point, but they, it's, it's like damming up the waterfall. If you dam up the waterfall, then water behind the waterfall gets, it starts to accumulate. So if it's those two that accumulate, we know that this is going to react with this. So that's what's happening in this, um, in this way that we found that this carrier two and this carrier three were associated with each other. I think you guys all need IVs of caffeine. Rough weekend? Well, this, this one particular respiratory inhibitor only blocks this reaction. So only these would get accumulated. So this is what they found. They found that um, these are, are inhibitors. So here, um, I don't think I would want to eat any of these. So take in that these molecules are blocking these um, these sites. Um, that's right, maybe carbon monoxide might not be so good. All right. Cyanide is also not a good thing to have around. And azide. I used to, does anybody <coughs> work in labs with azide anymore? Anybody? So when I would throw cells in like a shaker flask, we wouldn't want the water around the shaker flasks to get like gross things. So we would put sodium azide in it. And I think that's frowned upon now. The things that I used to do that we no longer are able to do is quite amazing. So at each one of those inhibition sites, is that where more of the, the reactants, reactants are accumulating? So then what happens? So you can't, what happens is you're not going to pass electrons along to oxygen. Right. You're not going to get the proton pumping. You're not going to make ATP, and you're dead. OK? So if you can't pass electrons on to oxygen, then you're dead. And we're going to talk more about that in the next slide. But I am going to take Is it used up anywhere, or it just remains there until, like, is it a temporary? 